I coped with feelings of failure, that I couldn't take care of my husband, that I couldn't do this. And I've been a successful person my whole life. And it was very difficult for me to admit, I can't do this um, anymore. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. It, it is a journey that multiple people have to help you on. Hello, I'm Fran Guasta Desangi, sitting in for Ann Hall. Welcome to Mature Living. Have you ever misplaced your keys or forgotten someone's name? Incidents like these happen to many of us, but is it just a lapse in memory or could it be something more serious? The Alzheimer's Association reports that dementia is a general term for loss of memory, language, problem solving, and other thinking abilities that are severe enough to interfere with daily life. Having memory loss alone doesn't mean that you have dementia. Memory loss can have different causes. And depending on the cause, some dementia symptoms might even be reversible. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Jennifer Paulderai from Innova Neurology to talk about this important topic. Thank you so much for being here. I, th let's talk about the terms dementia and Alzheimer's because I know that I use them interchangeably. I mean, is that wrong? Can you kind of break that down for us? I find that this is actually a very common question or a very common uh, mistake that people make when they meet me is they said, well, my loved one has dementia, but it wasn't Alzheimer's or they have Alzheimer's, but not dementia. So what is the difference, right? Dementia just means my brain needs a buddy to survive on this planet. I can't do the things that I need to do independently on my own. So dementia can be caused by anything, anything from stroke to too much fluid to trauma to Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is actually one type or one cause of dementia and it happens to be the most common cause. Okay, well, so, so let's talk about the prevalence. How prevalent is dementia? And have cases increased over the years, or are we just simply getting a little bit more aware of it? A little bit of both. So right now, there's probably 6.9 million people living with Alzheimer's-specific dementia in the United States. So that's quite a number. And, and as we get older, we actually have an increased risk of getting Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's-related dementias. So in our 60s, we've got probably about a 10% risk. In our 70s, maybe closer to 15. And then in our 80s, probably 30 to 35% of people have Alzheimer's. So it is prevalent as we get older, and it's getting worse as time goes on because we're living longer. We've got really cool medical technology that's making us live forever now, essentially. So that's what happens when our brain gets older. So let's talk about how do you get this disease? Let's start there. And then is it reversible? Can we do something to stop it somehow? Yeah. So how do, you, how do you get it? And then let's go from there. Yeah, very important question, right? So depending on the cause of dementia, if we're talking specifically about Alzheimer's, there's a genetic component, there's a lifestyle component, and then there's a I don't know component. So a lot of things like trauma, exposure to pollution, or exposure to various chemicals or toxins contributes to our lifetime risk of getting a neurodegenerative disease. Mm -hmm. Um, there are certain genes that can have mistakes, and when we have those abnormal genes, then we have a higher risk of getting these diseases, but there's no one cause of any of these dementias, actually. Well, let me ask you this, because I know that uh, Alzheimer's runs in my husband's family. His mom had it, and now should I be a little bit concerned as far as, you know, going down the line for my husband and even my son? I mean, how does that work? Yeah, in general for Alzheimer's, if you have a loved one that had Alzheimer's like after age 70, 75, mm -hmm. kind of later in life, that tends to be less hereditary. Mm -hmm. But if you have several generations of people getting Alzheimer's, it's something to look out for. Mm -hmm. 
I actually raise a red flag more if you tell me that your loved one had symptoms of Alzheimer's or dementia kind of earlier in life, like 60s, 50s, that tends to be a little bit more hereditary. But I always say, if you're having trouble with memory mm -hmm. and it's interfering with your ability to be an excellent human, then just get it checked out. I'd much rather be wrong and tell you it's stress or mm -hmm. sleep uh, than miss Alzheimer's or something developing. So that makes me feel a little bit better. So I appreciate your saying that. But let's talk about, okay, genetics aside, lifestyle. Uh, yeah. We all want to live a healthy life, but is something in is our lifestyle maybe contribute to that? And then let's talk about how to deal with that aspect. For sure. So the brain keeps score of everything that has happened to us in life, right? So that one concussion you had in football practice to how many years you've smoked to how many drinks you have, all of that contributes. So we wanna treat our brain the best possible by taking care of the nutrition we give it, the water, the hydration, the sleep, the mental health is so important for the development of brain disease. In addition to taking care of some of our other medical risk factors, so if you have diabetes or cholesterol problems, we really need to make sure those are kept in check mm -hmm. because the brain ultimately relies on blood flow and sugar and all of those things need to be very well managed mm -hmm. so that we keep our brain as healthy as possible. So making sure that we get the adequate rest that we need mm -hmm. to make sure that we're eating healthy and really being mindful as far as our stress. For sure, and, I, and I'll add that doing those things gets our brain in its most optimal state. Does it completely prevent the onset of diseases? No, because there is a part of it that is genetic and kind of random, right? Mm -hmm. But I always say, we can't control those things, we can't control our genes, but what we can control is how we treat our body and our brain, so at least let's control what we can. And let's get our brain as ready as possible to fight anything that comes at it. So let me ask you this, if somebody's in their mid-50s and maybe they've had smoking and maybe not eating like they should, can they at that stage, now being mindful about the impact that a non-healthy lifestyle, can they can they reverse course even at that late stage? Yes. So for the brain, everything adds up, right? So even if you were to quit smoking in your 50s, that's gonna have such a huge positive impact on your health overall and particularly for the brain. That's one less poison, one less toxin that the brain has to deal with. So later in life, we might be less at risk for developing dementias. Okay. Well, now let's talk about if your loved one is exhibiting some signs. So what are some signs to be aware of that might signal the onset of this? Yeah, I would look out for trouble completing tasks and activities that used to come very naturally to them. So perhaps we're missing medications, perhaps we're missing bill payments, and they used to be really on top of those bill payments. Maybe we're having more trouble understanding conversation. Perhaps we're having more trouble, even something like putting a magnet on a refrigerator might indicate that visuospatial reasoning is off, right? The brain does everything from thinking to talking to digestion to behaving to appetite. All of that's the brain. Mm -hmm. So if there really is something that seems off baseline and it's interfering with their ability to live and it's getting worse over time, mm -hmm. we've got to not forget the brain. It could be a brain problem that's developing. You are so knowledgeable about this whole subject. Tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to be in the position that you're in w with regard to this topic. Yeah, so I, I've been doing neurology for six years now. That means I help take care of all kinds of brain problems, but I've been specifically focused on cognition and behavioral neurology for the last two years now. I have specific training in that, and I, I chose to go forward with that specialty because I think it's such an integral part of who we are. Our mind and our thinking is really a, a tied into cognition and it can be a very vulnerable experience to have a cognitive disorder. So I felt that this is the area that I really wanted to help people in because it makes them human. I wanna help humans be human. So that was kind of my interest into this field and I have found it very, very rewarding to connect with both my patients and their families and their loved ones as they try to maneuver this life-changing illness. I really appreciate that. I know that uh, we're coming to a close as far as our conversation, but um, we've covered a lot of ground, but is there anything else that you would like to share? Because people watching this, they might have a loved one that they're wondering about, or they just might have some questions in general. So this is your opportunity. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our viewers? Yeah, I think the one last thing I will say that I have to repeat over and over sometimes is 
you are human. You're allowed to mess up. Your loved one's allowed to mess up too. So dementia is not the same in every single person that I see and caregiving is not the same in every single person I see. So one advice that you might get from one conference or one workshop might not work for you the next day or even the next hour. Be gracious to yourself and be gracious to your loved ones that are struggling with this. Mm -hmm. We're human. Nobody taught us how to do any of this. We, we learn on the go. It's kind of just like raising a child. Mm -hmm. Being a parent wasn't easy, right? And being a caregiver or a person with dementia is not easy. So just be kind and be gracious and, and roll with the punches. Excellent information. Really, really appreciate your being here today. Thank you very much for having me. I hope that this was helpful. You know that it is. Thank you. Later in the show, we'll learn about community organizations and other resources there are in Fairfax County to help those with dementia and their caregivers. But first, we'll hear from a local caregiver who has a family member with dementia. My husband was an Army officer. He retired after 22 years in the Army. My husband was the main child caregiver for our daughter. I went back to work when she was three months old and he cared for her until she went to kindergarten. That was a very unusual thing to do at the time. Not many men stayed home and were house husbands. I took my husband on a surprise trip for his 75th birthday and we visited places that he had last visited when he was a child like Lake George. My husband was an excellent swimmer. He swam at West Point and then after he retired from the Army and was a caregiver for our daughter, he became a professional swim coach and coached for 30 years. So we visited places that he swam at when he was a child. And on that trip, I noticed some odd things. For example, on the way home, I asked my husband to look at the atlas the eastern portion of Pennsylvania to find a new route for our way home because the traffic was very bad. And he could not locate the routes or the highways or the interstates that I asked him to find. And I thought that was quite odd because he was an army officer and he knew land navigation. So I found a neuropsychology practice and can endure it eight hours worth of testing. Um, it, it was quite exhausting. And he was diagnosed then when he was mm, 76 years old with mild cognitive impairment. He, he didn't react a whole lot when he was told, and he was told forthrightly by a neurologist at Walter Reed that he had Alzheimer's dementia. I think it, truly it didn't affect him a whole lot because our lifestyle was still pretty much the same. We were pretty active. Uh, my husband has always enjoyed music. We still kept up our subscription at Wolf Trap. He did go to an occupational therapist who said, based upon the results of your test, I recommend that you stop driving. If there's one piece of news that he reacted to, it was not driving. I noticed his inability to, to do things and his inability to sign his name, for example. We kept on voting, we had mail-in ballots um, so that he didn't embarrass himself. Um, and that's one thing that I really wanted to avoid. I, I wanted Ken to keep his dignity. Um, and so I tried to set up situations that he could still perform activities, although they may have been altered, um, he still was able to do things until maybe about two years ago started changing and then pretty dramatic decline the last year. Um, and of course he had been increasing his medication. Walter Reed had prescribed different medication um, for him. And I noticed that he became um, very obstinate about doing certain things. And that's when life became a, a little harder um, for him and for me. Well, I watched various webinars from Fairfax County. And one of the webinars was um, featured a caregiver with whom I had worked um, many years earlier. And she mentioned the Insight Memory Care Center and that it really helped her and her husband, who subsequently has died. Um, 
she enrolled him in this Insight Memory Care Center to give him some structure and her some relief. And I actually also found um, a professional counselor ab about dementia through a webinar and I had a Zoom session with her and came to the realization that she said, if he goes to a day center or, or is in a residential facility, there's so much activity. She said, you can't possibly provide him enough stimulation and activity as the memory care centers can. So I enrolled Ken for three days a week at the Insight Memory Care Center. So that really did make a difference. It freed me up to make doctor's appointments and to do the volunteer work that gave me sustenance as my husband uh, declined. One of the major factors in my decision to move Ken to a residential facility was my realization that should I fall, should I have a heart attack, should I have a stroke, my husband would not know to call 911. He would no longer had the capability to do that. The watchword is, you can't take care of someone else if you're exhausted, either physically or mentally. So as far as I'm concerned, if someone asked me, when did you know it was time? I knew it was time when I was exhausted, okay? When I started feeling resentful um, and, and angry about certain things, even though I know it, it, he didn't mean to do that. And the activities that we used to do here in the house were no longer of interest to him. So those combinations of things told me it was time to find a residential facility for him. I started learning about Alzheimer's and getting tips about caring for someone and caring for myself. I found the Fairfax County material on the web about um, aging in place, um, about dementia care. Um, it is so wonderful. It is so wonderful. I attended so many different webinars about very, very good topics. Um, caring for oneself, caring for your loved one, um, preparing for movement. I even attended one for preparing for death um, and found that, although a sobering topic, it was very helpful. So I really took advantage of the resources that Fairfax County um, government um, had. And the Alzheimer's Association, um, I. I get their newsletter um, and they have really wonderful resources as, as well and very good educational programs. The most important advice is reach out for help because you will not make it by yourself. You will not make it by yourself. In our first segment, we talk with Dr. Jennifer Polderai from Innova Neurology. She provided a great overview of the various types of dementia, and now we'll explore resources available to those living with dementia and their caregivers. We now welcome Allegra Jaffe, a social services supervisor with the Department of Family Services. So glad that you're here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Allegra, let me just ask you, just off the bat, our population is aging, and I know that dementia in older adults, it seems to be more prevalent, but you know, what resources are available for those who have dementia and their caregivers here in Fairfax County? The best place to start is with our ADCR line, which stands for Aging, Disability, Caregiver, Resource Line. And this is housed within the Fairfax Area Agency on Aging. And what it is, it's a phone line with master level social workers who answers the phone. They're available Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30 and they are the open door to our programs. Mm -hmm. So they can do information and referral. They, you can call and, and ask them questions about what's going on in your house or maybe your neighbor or even a long distance family member and, and they can listen to you and provide advice about next steps. So it's a terrific resource to start. We also have uh, different options for folks who need to have a place, a respite. So when I say respite, I'm saying a place for a break, whether that is a, um, somewhere you can bring your loved one all day, maybe it would be having someone come to your house uh, to help you, um, or it could look like uh, 
Respite could also look like, where can I go with my loved one so we could have a break together? And I, I know it sounds like when you have your loved one, is that really a break? But when you're not just caregiving and you're connecting, that is a break. That is different mm -hmm. uh, than your typical daily routine of taking care of someone. So let's, l l about these resources. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, uh, that line, that ADCR mm -hmm. line that you told us about, because that is, seems like that's a really good first stop. Yes. But now as far as the, um, resources. So there are facilities in Fairfax County where um, it's almost like a, a daycare kind of thing. Mm. So, I, you know, I imagine that there's a cost associated with it. So tell us a little bit about, you know, is it just strictly a daycare? Do Are there options for um, the person with dementia to stay for an extended time. I mean, I'm not really sure of how all that works. So let's sure. just talk about the person with dementia and the resources available to that population. Sure, sure. So in Fairfax County, we have adult day healthcare centers. And so these centers, um, several of them even have transportation so that your loved one can get to the center. And in those centers, there's different options. Some of them may have scholarships available. Uh, sliding scale fees, um, there's private pay options. Uh, so that is something that our Fairfax County has uh, for our residents. And so it, it's terrific. It's a great place. It's more of a Monday through Friday, though. This is not an overnight stay. This is for folks who need to go get groceries, who have a job, who, you know, it's a daytime hours. Uh, and with the adult day healthcare centers, uh, in addition, they have nurses, they have OTs, they have PTs. So it's a therapeutic environment where you can bring your loved one. Um, th now, if somebody needs overnight care or longer time care, mm -hmm. there are facilities that do respite options where you can bring your loved one to stay for a weekends, for example. Now, you're going to be looking at more private funding <laughs> for this. In addition, um, some folks do have long-term care. So you can always check to see if your long-term care uh, can also pay for if you need someone to stay somewhere overnight in a facility. And those are private pay, again, mm -hmm. um, so, but that's an option. Well, then we're going to switch gears now. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the caregiver because uh, if the caregiver needs a little bit more information or just someone to talk to, are there webinars? Are there, is there a phone line where they could call and just vent? Absolutely, and we need to support the family caregiver or we're not supporting the person living with dementia. And so for the caregiver here in the county, we have consultations free of cost for family caregivers. So Fairfax County Area Agency on Aging partners with Elderlink and Elderlink provides us uh, consultations for our family caregivers. So caregivers can call, they can schedule a time to speak to an expert about what their options are, what's going on at the home, mm -hmm. and have an hour to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, uh, Alzheimer's Association, um, nonprofit, mm -hmm. has a 24 seven phone line where folks can call in in the middle of the night and, and get information. And they don't only uh, specify in Alzheimer's, it, they do all types of cognitive impairment mm -hmm. and dementia. Mm -hmm. So that is a great resource as well, is the Alzheimer's Association. Mm -hmm. Well now, let's, we're still talking about resources. And you know, if someone realizes their loved one has dementia and they need that additional help, is it hard to enroll in one of these day programs or, you know, I mean, is there like a backlog? I'm not really sure if, how that works. It really depends on where you're looking. Because um, in addition to the adult day health care centers and Elderlink, in mm -hmm. addition, has respite options mm -hmm. where you have uh, folks who can come to your home. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a Cherry Blossom Pace. We have a PACE program in, in, in some of the zip codes are covered. This is covered by Medicaid and different insurances, mm -hmm. and it's another day program. So I, I'm bringing this up because there's so many options. It's really, and some might have a waiting list and some may not. Uh, so in addition, there is Insight Memory Care Center. They're a nonprofit in our area, and they also have day centers that mm -hmm. you can utilize. And so it really depends on us looking to see what's the appropriate fit for your loved one and, and kind of matching to see mm -hmm. is there space, is there not space, and then figuring out maybe it's also do we have someone who can come to the home. Not everybody has to leave the home. There's so many options of getting support at home as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. 
I, I love everything that you're saying because it really, it's a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. You know, you're taking care of the uh, person with the dementia, but also the caregiver. Right. Is there any other community organizations that caregivers can turn to that will also offer support? There's so much out there, but you know, is there anything else within the community mm -hmm. that they can mm -hmm. look to? Well, uh, yes. And before I jump into that, I also want to mention too, here in the county, we do have the webinars, for example, we have virtual webinars. Um, we have ones that are specific for dementia, uh, for and workshops, and just for people living with dementia and their loved ones to even go together. Mm -hmm. So we have also playlists and uh, just doctors that come in. So we have great resources for education. Mm -hmm. In addition, in the community at large, there is a program called RAFT. Mm -hmm. And RAFT it will come to your home free of cost for about, I want to say, eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And they will come and train the caregiver. And their focus is to make sure that your loved one can stay at home as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So they can come and do uh, interventions. Uh, they can do education. And they do one-on-one -on -one training with you and your loved one. Uh, so that's another terrific resource that folks just don't know about. <laughs> that is fantastic because you really do have to be mindful caring for yourself as you're caring for your loved one. Allegra, this is such important work that you do. How did you come to do the job that you do right now? Mm -hmm. I have been doing work in the aging field for about a five years, uh, but before this, um, my father had a traumatic brain injury uh, seven years ago, and so he now has memory loss as well. And so it is very much a, a personal connection, um, and we're now his family caregivers as well. So we, we take care of him in our house. Uh, we're, I'm a sandwich caregiver, so I have a, a baby and I have my dad um, in the home with my, me and my husband. And so um, it's very much, this is part of my life as well, inside and outside of work. <laughs> so. wow, what a labor of love. Mm, yes, yes. We're, we're coming very quickly to the end of our uh, conversation here. Uh, do, do you have any last minute uh, comments or any other nuggets that you want to share before we say our goodbyes? Mm -hmm. I want to share uh, with folks who are living with dementia and, and their caregiver that you're not alone, mm -hmm. um, that there is support out there for you. So many uh, family caregivers, the research is showing that family caregivers will pass away before their loved one. Um, more and more because they're not able to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying this to say, please get support. Please don't do this alone. Um, it's not made to be alone. And, and for the community at large, let's uh, find ways to, to help folks and, and make it inclusive here. Uh, we make the, the community inclusive for people with disabilities and we should with people living with dementia. Yep. Um, and most people living with dementia are very isolated and so are their family caregivers. So really we have a great opportunity to find ways to, to connect and support all those living in our community. It truly takes a village, doesn't it? It does. Oh it does. my it goodness. Does. Allegra, thank you so much. It was a quick conversation, but it was so informative and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you for watching this edition of Mature Living. I'm Fran Guasta and we'll see you next time.